Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Conversations on international relations inevitably rely on simplifications, and the discourse on South Korea is no exemption. Korea does this, Korea thinks that. Reality is, of course, much more complex, with popular sentiment frequently diverging from foreign policy and contrasting views within public opinion itself. To learn more about how Koreans view their neighbors in East Asia, what they think about their government's foreign policy, and how these views differ within the general population, we had the privilege of interviewing Karl Friedhoff. Karl is a program officer at the Center for Public Opinion and Quantitative Research at the Asan Institute in Seoul. He co-authored various reports and publications on public opinion and polling in Korea. Prior to his current position, Karl interned with the Korea Economic Institute in Washington, D.C., and was a program assistant at the Institute for Global Economics in Seoul. He earned his master's degree from Seoul National University in 2010. Karl Friedhoff, uh, welcome to Korea and the World. Uh, Thanks for the invitation. What brought you to Korea and how do you specialize in Korean public opinion? Well, originally I I was in the U.S., of course, and I, I just decided it was time for me to get out of the U.S. And I think I had just graduated university at the time, and I found a job teaching originally, and I got here, got in country, started to learn the language, and from there it was just kind of slowly climbing up the ladder. So I did import-export for a couple years, then I did my master's here, and just because I'm a news junkie and I had a background in a bit of statistics, once I got to Asan, they needed someone who had both of those things, who could keep up with all of the stuff going on domestically, internationally, as well as being able to put it all together with what it means for the polling numbers. At the time when I started doing polling, I actually had no background in it. I just kind of knew about statistics. But it wasn't really that difficult, and that's how I I got involved. And so it was kind of trial and error throughout the whole process, and now now it just kind of runs runs by itself. When we talk about Korean public opinion, what is the uh, political context? How receptive is Korean foreign policy to public opinion, for example? Um, Do attitudes on foreign policy in other countries, do, do they play a role in domestic elections? In domestic elections, it's pretty unusual that any elections around the world that you'll see foreign policy play a major goal. There are some exceptions to that. Of course, there's always a lot of talk about North Korea in South Korea. But in the 2012 election, the North Korea played almost no role whatsoever. Both of the, the candidates, Moon Jae-in and Park Geun-hye, had very similar stances. I think there's a general feeling that the sunshine policy has come and gone. No one really wants to go back to that. And when we, when we were tracking this over time, we, we asked these questions about what is the most important policy issue, the most salient issue for the public, and we'll track you know, job creation, economic democratization, redistribution of wealth, and those two kind of pair together. And then North Korea is in there along with education, and North Korea is almost always at the very bottom. So the only time that we'll see spikes in that is when there's a missile test or a nuclear test. And then we'll see it jump maybe five or 10 points, but then immediately it declines once again. And so foreign policy is there, Mm. but it's really not that big of an issue. North Korea doesn't factor in. The alliance with the U.S., everyone has kind of reached a consensus for now that it's it's in Korea's interest to be maintained. We have support of over over 90% in general. Everyone realizes where China is going to be and that that relationship needs to be strong. And no one really wants to deal with Japan. So everyone has agreed on these things, so it doesn't really feature into the domestic elections. I think first I'd like to talk about the United States, um, the relationship with uh, South Korea. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you specifically uh, about an opinion poll released by the uh, Chicago Council on Foreign Affairs. And according to that poll, uh, Americans rate South Korea 55 out of 100, Mm -hmm. um, which is an all-time high, but doesn't sound that high to me, 55 out of 100. And only 47% of Americans do believe or do think that the U.S. should support South Korea should North Korea attack. Right. So do these results echo uh, Korean public opinion on the relationship with the U.S.? So how, how does that play out? So I'll answer that question in two parts. And the first part is when you have this 55 and 47 percent. On the 47 about, you know, should support South Korea in time of war, I think if that were actually to happen, you would see it jump immediately. Right. It would become a much more urgent issue. And then the U.S., most U.S. citizens would realize, okay, this is something we have to do. On, on the 55 percent rating them favorably, and I was actually at the conference where this was, was presented, and I know the, the people who have conducted this poll. And the big concern when you, when you talk about attitudes on, in the U.S. on Korea is that you're never quite sure how closely the respondents are paying attention to the question. And so they might hear Korea, and then it becomes a question, well, are they able to separate South Korea from North Korea? 
because in most most places where where you're going around and you're dealing with institutes and people doing research and, and for me I'm around people who deal with Korea all the time and so for them it's not a question and you get into this habit of thinking well of course everyone understands that difference and you start to assume that but that's not always the case so I, I'm from Indiana for example and at times I, I've been home and maybe I'm, I'm not so proud to admit this but people around me at times I'll say that oh I've been living in Korea and they'll say immediately the good one or the bad one right and if you, if you include South Korea within the question then that can eliminate some of that. But I think that may play into some of that that fairly low rating. Of course, at the same time, there's been mad, bad news about the FTA, that it's working more to Korea's favor and, and not so much to the, United, the favor of the United States. So they, that may be playing a role into it. So you know, parsing why the U.S. is thinking what it, what it thinks about South Korea is, is a little bit difficult because there's so many factors at play. But as for there being something kind of reciprocal in that, not at all. I mean, there, is, there are bouts of anti-Americanism here, but when we're asking and looking at questions about the United States, we're now seeing historic highs for positivity towards the United States. Part of that, I think, is that there's a realization that the United States alliance is important for Korea for its security. North Korea is a much more dangerous country. There are concerns, underlying concerns about China, which I think we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later. Yes. But also there, there is this, this learning process by the USFK, the United States uh, Forces Korea, where they now understand that public opinion can react swiftly to any mistakes they've made. And it's especially swift if there's a problem and they react poorly. And the people within the strategy team at USFK, I know that they watch public opinion very quickly. They are students of public opinion, and I think they try to monitor and really predict what problems might be coming up. And as if there is a problem, I think you see now the commanders really trying to get in front of the problem before that starts. And so it's really happening on both sides, where there's a realization on, on the Korean side, and also the, the U.S. side is doing a much better job of when there are issues, trying to limit them and, and uh, cut them off before they, they mushroom into kind of street protests that we've seen in the past. Does the uh, State Department or the U.S. Army uh, have their own opinion polls, their own data gathering, or do they heavily rely on your work, for example. There, I, I know that a lot of our work gets into them, and I make a point to, to talk to those people and get our reports that are relevant to them. The State Department does do its own polling. However, none of that is public. Right. It's all classified. I, I know the people who do it, and they are excellent at their job. And you know, when we get together, of course, we have little pol pollster parties where <laughs> everyone comes together and, and talks about you know, what they're seeing in the numbers. And that's always really interesting. But I can say that, that from, from what I'm hearing out of them and from, from our numbers, we're seeing very similar things. Um, let's focus on North Korea now. Um, I think it's no surprise that South Koreans have negative attitudes towards North Korea. Right. Yet, I think you also emphasize in your research that they do care about their neighbor and they favor engagement. So does this go against the common idea that South Koreans don't really care about the North anymore? Or is this maybe a generational thing? So yeah, the, the, the attitudes that, that come out on North Korea are quite complex and, and a little bit confusing and, so, and even conflicting. And I think that's somewhat symbolic in that, you know, the Korean public, they, they do have this very complicated relationship where the constitution says that all North Koreans are South Koreans and that eventually, you know, they'll be reunited. But at the same time, they're, you know, threatening nuclear war, they're testing missiles, they're having nuclear tests. And that really creates problems for the South Koreans that they don't feel, and they're probably right, well, they are right, they don't deserve to be threatened like that. So when, when we run our, our country favorability, every time, well, almost every time, bar a few months, North Korea is at the bottom. So we run this zero to 10 scale, we ask them, you know, what's your favorability? Zero is low, 10 is high. And they come in, you know, 2.0 something, 2.4. The only time that they have been not been the lowest is when Japan has actually been lower. Uh, when, when you also look at the leader favorability, then you have Kim Jong-un. He's also almost always the lowest, mm. except for the times when Shinzo Abe is lowest. <laughs> and then they, they're basically uh, neck and neck. So, yeah, there's this complicated relationship. And... Part of it is generational. When we look at the 40s and 30s, this is kind of the part of the 386 generation. The 30s might be on the low end of that, and it's now starting to creep into the mid 50s for this generation. And they are the people who have come up with sunshine policy. That's where, like, during their formative years, when they were trying to figure out how they were going to, to approach problems politically, 
the, the progressives were powerful. They elected two presidents and they came up to the street protest. They were hoping that the relationship with North Korea could really be prepared. When, when we look at the data visually, uh, depending on the question, you might see the 40s and 30s have the most positive attitudes towards North Korea. And the expectation by a lot of scholars was that this would continue for the group in their 20s. That the 40s would be positive, the 30s would be more positive, mm -hmm. and the 20s would be even more positive because they, they think about North Koreans as one of them. They really want to have reunification. They want to have good relations. But that's not what, what has happened. Instead, we have the 60s having the most negative attitudes and most, most hard line on, on security, and the 20s having almost the mirror image of the 60s. While the 20s are more progressive on all social issues, when it comes to North Korea, they're very hardline, they're very security conservative. We, we saw this actually come out immediately following the sinking of the Chonan. And while there wasn't, as far as I know, a lot of work done on 20s attitudes towards North Korea before the sinking of the Chonan, as soon as that happened, I think we, we saw a big change where you have the, the cohort in their 20s they're much more you know, worldly. They've, they've grown up in a South Korea that's always been affluent, and they've known no other South Korea. And so they have this new kind of burgeoning confidence. And for them, they're thinking, well, why should this poor northern country really be able to push us around? And what also ties into that is there's a shift in identity formation. In the older, among the older generations, it was always, well, we're not Japan, we're not China. There was this kind of, they needed this other to help form their identity. But the 20s aren't really doing that. They're just saying, well, we are South Korean and it doesn't really matter what anyone else. So there's this kind of confidence going on. We've been rerunning surveys that were done 10 years ago where they break identity formation into civic and ethnic components. Mm -hmm. And among the civic component, it has stayed about level over 10 years. Among the ethnic component, it's come down among all generations, but the biggest drop has been among people in their 20s where the ethnic component is far less important to them. And when you roll that forward then and tie that into North Korea, I mean, that's one of the, the most common bonds with North Korea is that you have this ethnic bind. And if the 20s aren't going to see that, that's becoming less important. It's going to make them more likely to treat North Korea not as, you know, a, a, as a one of us, but as either an enemy or just a neighbor or as a strange country. And they just want to see it treated like you would treat any other country that's threatening you with nuclear weapons. Not, and there's no real exception. That is a, a massive change, is that North Korea could be seen as a third party one day. Right, right. And that's one thing. We're, we're not quite sure what's going to happen with the generations moving forward, because if they do follow the trend of the 20s, where they, they see this and they're not tying in their ethnic bond or their identity formation into North Korea, then yes, because that's one of the, the underlying theoretical principles that reunification by, by choice will have to take place eventually. But if the younger generations no longer see that as, as a necessity, then what becomes a reunification? Maybe they'll become more comfortable with the idea of the two Koreas just being a, a federation, where as long as North Korea is not threatening, then, well, they're fine with the regime in place and just kind of ignoring them and allowing them to stay isolated. We don't really know where that will end right now, and a lot of that will probably depend on North Korea's behavior. But if it doesn't change, I can see that the young generations coming up will continue to have that. And this, this push for reunification, you know, it, it could certainly falter. Generally, what is the attitude towards North Korea? Is it seen more as a military threat, as a poor neighbor who may or may not need, you know, support? Mm -hmm. Or is it still a brother, a brother nation? Um, you just said that the, that the right. younger generation less have this feeling a bit less, but... Yeah, we, we do some polling on that where we present five options, and one of the words we use is Udi, one of us, mm. and then we present, is it a neighbor, a, an enemy, or just a stranger? And so there, there's one other option that I can't think of off the top of my head, but again, we get this kind of U-shape where the people in the 40s are much more likely to see North Korea as one of us, but people in their 20s and 60s are much more likely to see it as an enemy. And going back to the, to the one of us, it's the 20s who are the least likely consistently over several years to see North Korea as one of us. And you know, I, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Does the uh, North Korean leadership play a role in shaping these South Korean attitudes? Did, for example, the, um, 
the death of Kim Jong Il and the rise of Kim Jong Un to power change anything? Or in in the polling, there's generally a feeling that Kim Jong Un is a little more dangerous and that he's a little more unpredictable. We do see some of that, but there is a separation, I think, between the people and the government, because when we run these favorability polls. The, the favorability of North Korea, the country, is always slightly, uh, significantly higher than the favorability of the leader himself. And so there is some separation there, but it's not so big as you might think where it, the gap is obvious and it's very large. Um, more specifically on the unification, um, or reunification, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned already a bit on that, but um, do you think the recent efforts of the Pagane administration to describe reunification as a economic bonanza is currently trending. Does it have any effect? Um, again, is it generational? When, when she came out with that statement, she used the word debak, which is kind of this youth slang. And so it was very much aimed at getting the youth on board. Uh, if you run focus groups, which I have not, but people who do run focus groups on these issues say that the youth is, is now really on board and that they're talking about reunification with North Korea being good for the economy. But in the macro data, where we do a, a, pu a public opinion survey of the whole population, we don't see that. What we've been asking is interest in reunification. And in 2010, among people in their 20s, that interest was very low. It's difficult to know what interest exactly means. Um, that, that number peaked in 2012 under Im Young Bak, and since then it's actually declined. And we asked this question not long before the, the reunification as bonanza speech, and not long after. And among the youth, interest in reunification actually declined. So it looks like this, this bonanza theory or her, her idea hasn't really caught on. We're not really seeing any movement on it. it it's, it's just kind of an idea that's out there, like most of the, the administration ideas. It's out there without any real bones on it. It's just a structure. It, well, it's difficult to even really call it a structure for a lot of their ideas. So the, the public hasn't really caught on. Uh, one of the problems is I think that everyone is, is well aware of the difficulty of actually of carrying it through. So the general idea, I think, is you take South Korea's high technology and marry it with the labor. Yes, the right. problem is, is that if you look at the demographic profiles of each country, they're almost identical. That you have a lot of old people and very few young people. And marrying those things, you might get a short-term gain, but you're actually just going to make the, the, the welfare system even harder to control when all these people start to age, especially among the, the very poor North Koreans. You're not going to have this big youth influx that they think can solve their own demographic problems. And so long term, was that going to be an economic benefit? Maybe, but it's not quite clear to me just because of the demographic profiles that reunification will work the way that they intend it to. Do we have any data on attitudes towards trust politic? Uh, we interviewed um, Professor Lankov and he said that mm -hmm. trust politic is a great thing as long as it's done. Uh, because they, they talk a lot about it, but um, any, any data on that? We, we've asked, we haven't asked specifically about trust politic, but we have asked about North Korea policy in general. And a majority come out saying, well, we like the policy where it is, or we want it to be harder line. If you combine those two, you get a majority. No one really wants to see it go in a softer way. Uh, I think there would be, as long as North Korea is willing to cooperate, there will be support for whatever Pak Geun Hye decides to do. But there is a general feeling that the South Korean public wants South Korea for once to dictate the terms of the engagement. For so long, it's been North Korea kind of almost playing games with South Korea just to see if they can get South Korea to react. But one time we saw a very clear spike in Park Geun Hye's presidential approval numbers was when she called North Korea's bluff on Kaesong, where they said, hey, you know what, we'll close Kaesong. And she said, okay, fine, pull all of the workers. Kaesong was shuttered. That was an incredibly popular move among the Korean public because for once, South Korea seemed like it was dictating the game. That momentum has since been lost. But if she can do that and make it seem as if South Korea is in control, she has a lot of leeway for how she deals with North Korea, so long as North Korea is dealing back and it's not just a one-way giving street. Let's move to Japan now. Um, I think you mentioned it. Um, Japan is on level with North Korea when it comes yes. to popularity amongst uh, South Koreans. Right. How does it come about that Japan does not only attract little affection, but is seen on eye level with a country South Korea is at least on paper still at war with. Yeah, that's one of the very disconcerting things that always comes up. I think for especially non-observers of East Asia, you know, we had this this interview with Pak Geun Hye that she did with Lucy Williamson while Lucy was still at the BBC. And I really thought it was such a great interview because at one point Lucy comes out and she asks first about Kim Jong-un saying, well, you know, would you meet him? 
And President Park says, yes, you know, if the timing is right and we, we can discuss things, I'll be happy to meet him and we can work through our issues and come to some kind of common understanding about reunification. And that conversation goes on and Lucy follows up with, well, what about uh, Prime Minister Abe? Would you meet him? And the, the answer is basically absolutely not. And I really think that was a big mistake and a big blow to the Park administration at the time because while that can play for the domestic audience, you know, the BBC is not catering to the domestic audience, right? It's going out to people all over the world and people who don't follow East Asia or understand the, the, the particulars of the history, hearing a democratically elected president say that she'll meet with a dictator who's now been accused of just the worst crimes right. against humanity and you know they're trying to drag him in front of the ICC and deservedly so, say that she'll meet with him at any time, but not another democratically elected leader is jarring to say the least. And I think you know that that kind of puts it into a highlight about where the relationship is with Japan. And so oftentimes when we have our numbers come out that, that show that Prime Minister Abe is ranked even lower in favorability than Kim Jong-un, kind of puts that into perspective. The, the ranking of the country is actually significantly higher than the, the ranking of the leader. Uh, that's not uncommon for North Korea, both North Korea and Japan, but the, the gap is bigger on Japan. And I think that makes sense within, within the context that Japanese culture is actually very big here. Mm. You know, Japanese movies are always very big. Japanese food is always very popular. It's just that they don't like the leadership right now. You make the uh, argument in your research that historical grievances are, are not the primary cause of this dislike, but rather how Japan is behaving today. Right, I, I think that comes out a lot in the media. There's so much focus on the history that what, uh, what Japan is doing today is, is a bit underserved, but also not only what it's doing today, but Korea is trying to redefine the relationship for the future. So one of the things we often track is confidence that Koreans have in themselves and in their country. And when we ask this, we, we ask on a range of countries, which country do you think is the most influential now? And which country do you, do you think will be the most influential in the future? We, we don't quite word the question that way. We use a scale of zero to 10 and rank each country. And so every time that we've asked on current influence, the US is number one. And on current influence, Koreans actually rate themselves the lowest of any country. North Korea is excluded from that. So it's the US, China, Russia, Japan, and South Korea. Koreans rank themselves the lowest in, in global influence currently. If you ask in 10 years time, Koreans expect themselves to be as influential as Russia and much more influential than Japan. Now, anytime you, you bring that up to a specialist or someone, they'll, they'll scoff and say, well, that's impossible. But they, that's really missing the point of the question is that it's about an expectation that Koreans have of where their country is headed and where they think Japan is headed. So they see themselves on opposite paths. And I think they're really trying to redefine that relationship for the future to show Japan that, you know what, we are the new power on the block. Japan is in decline. Abenomics, we now know it looks like it's, it's largely... Not really working. Yeah, it's, it's largely having problems. The Korean economy, you know, despite them raising the alarm bell, saying that, you know, we're on the path towards Japan, still looks to be doing okay. And so there's a sense that Korea is the new power. And it should no longer have to deal with a Japan that is recalcitrant and unwilling to deal with history. It is also about history, but it's also heavily about the future. The, the age gaps that come into that, we will see the different generations react much differently to certain events. So we, we asked country favorability before and after the Yasukuni visit on December 26, 2013. Uh, during that time, we had happened to ask the question just prior to that, earlier in the month, and we had the chance to ask it again, right at the beginning of January. And when we broke that down by age court, it was actually quite interesting because we have this trended over two or three years. And immediately after the Yasukuni visit, there was a decline in favorability among the 60s, a significant decline. Less of a decline among the 50s, even less of a decline among the 40s, and among the 30s and the 20s, no decline at all. And if we, we went back and tracked that for several other times where there have been issues with Yasukuni, and each time is the same. So for the younger generations, they don't care about Yasukuni. They, they mm -hmm. recognize, I think, that it's a historical issue, but it doesn't affect them directly. But when there were issues with comfort women or issues with the importation of supposedly nuclear fish, you know, fished out of the water surrounding Fukushima, that is when we saw the biggest declines for people in their 20s, but nothing among people in their 60s. So the 20s look at Japan, and, and if it's going to affect them personally, their health, then they're more likely to see their favorability de decline for Japan. 
And so for me, that was a very interesting. But the one thing that I think everyone agrees on uh, issues with Japan, it's, it's Dokdo is number one. Comfort women is actually last. It's the mm. lowest, and even though it gets the most attention currently. And then historical issues are actually in the middle. Um, going back to Shinzo Abe, the current Japanese prime minister, um, as you mentioned, he seems to be a special object of loathing. <laughs> is this dislike directed at his office or is there a personal dimension? I think it's directed specifically at him. You know, as, as far as his cabinet, you know, he surrounded himself with people that, that are also outspoken on the issues that he's outspoken on. But it, is, it does seem to be a special loathing against him. You know, at one point he showed up in a fighter jet, this photo op where it had on, on the side 713. What does that mean? The, the people who had seen it and picked up on it thought it was an indirect reference to Unit 713, which performed live human experimentation on Koreans in Manchuria. And so that, of course, that it was, it was placed on the side of this airplane within a photo op picture did not go over very well with many in Korea. So there have been all these kinds of missteps where he's visiting Yasukuni, he's looking in and kind of trying to redo some of the, the, the Moriyama statement that has been out, kind of undermining the legitimacy of that. That's what a lot of people see it as. And now even in D.C., if you, if you track back and can talk to a lot of the, the people who follow these issues and all the background chatter going on about Abe is that he is a true believer, you know, the, the, that Japan did nothing wrong, nothing beyond what anyone else had done in war, and they were truly a victim of Victor's justice. And now he's trying to write that, saying that Japan needs to reclaim its, its rightful place in history, it should not be ashamed of its history, and that rubs a lot of Koreans the wrong way, considering how much they have suffered at the hands of Japan in the past. If we look at this train relations between South Korea and Japan, is public opinion a cause or consequence of this relationship? Where is the causality there? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, when we look at President Park, this was said to me by someone at the U.S. Embassy, she's kind of set out her line where she's going to be on Japan. Well, the foreign minister sees that line, and then he decides, well, if I want my job to be good, I'm going to move slightly to the right of that. And then it gets down to the director general, or maybe the vice minister and then the director general, where everyone sets the line further and further to the right, and really nothing can happen with Japan, even at the working level. So even at those levels, things are now, are now frozen. The causality, you know, there, all of our polling shows that there is wide support and a majority almost every time want a summit to take place. They are in support of President Park going to meet President Abe because the idea being, of course, that, well, if you have problems, the leaders have to meet to talk it out because that's the fastest way to get things done. But there's so much fear of the loud minority. That silent majority is, majority is there, but the loud minority is so loud that it can create huge problems for anyone involved. You know, there are stories of people coming out and saying, well, Japan... We have to work with them. Things haven't been all bad in our relationship. We have to look at some of the positives, and it can make them lose their jobs. You know, you have people out protesting in front of the Japanese embassy where they take a hammer and literally smash the heads of the Japanese national bird on the street. You have people cutting off their fingers in front of the Japanese embassy. You know, all of these things happen, and so people see these things and say, well, you know what? I might silently support that our, and accept that our relationship with Japan needs to improve. However... I don't want to risk my job on it. And so they tend to stay out of it. Is there anything the Japanese government could do to improve these South Korean attitudes? Or is the ball in South Korea's court? And I think specifically, would it help for Japan to apologize um, again or, you know, according to whatever standard that mm -hmm. has been set by South Korea? There are a lot of stories that at one point under Noda and Im young bak that they had, they had come extremely close to a deal. Uh, Japan thought the deal was sealed, which was going to include uh, a whole package the Korean government came back and said, oh yeah, by the way, we can't accept that because our NGOs won't accept that. You know, there are, there are stories that they, the Korean government has pressured the, the comfort women not to accept payment from the Japanese government because then they are no longer eligible to get payment from the Korean government. So they're, they're actually kind of playing hot potato with this. So at some points, the ball will be in Japan's court. And, you know, th these things are oftentimes after there's a Yasukuni visit or there's something controversial is said. So Korea can step back and say, see, it's not us. It's, it's, it's the evil Japanese that are the problem. So if there's going to be any kind of improvement, they need to do things. And things will then move on. And a lot of this pressure, pressure actually comes out of D.C. That's where it originates, where you have people there 
who are fairly influential and in, because that's where political discussions take place on the international scene. And what was really kind of politically savvy about Abe the last time he visited Yasukuni is that he did it and he also announced the, the, the basing issue on Okinawa, saying that right. that was going to be taken care of. So he did those two things at the same time and the U.S. really wants that base and they really want to see Japan take on more of a role in, in peacekeeping and develop its own, uh, own, own, own forces. And so after that happened, the ball was back in South Korea's court where it was, see, Japan's not so bad. Why, what's wrong with the South Koreans? Why aren't they moving to, to improve this relationship? And our polling, of course, did not help matters because we had a majority and continue to have a majority saying President Park needs to meet Prime Minister Abe. And so that, that potato kind of goes back and forth. They play a lot of the blame game. But now it looks increasingly like President Park's diplomacy is on the verge of failure. The, the relationship with the U.S. Is, is fine. Things are not good with North Korea. Things are not good with Japan. They expected that they could approach China and get some movement on China on North Korea. But now they're starting to realize that that's not happening either. And now you have a bit of a warming between China and Japan. And so where does that leave South Korea? It leaves South Korea out. I think it's now time to move to the elephant in the room, that is China. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that many countries, um, especially the United States, showcase a rather worried attitude towards China's rise. Um, what is the situation in Korea? Korea has an, an interesting take on China because uh, on one level, they are very positive. You know, behind the United States, they're the second most favored country. And that, that gap is, is somewhat shrinking over, the, over time. Xi Jinping is the second most favored leader in the region behind President Obama. And again, that gap is not very big. On the whole, there is a very positive assessment of President Park's diplomacy towards China. The fact that under Im young Bak, relationship was very cold and she has repaired that. It looks like the business relationship is going to improve. And in the first year, everyone was saying, wow, she's done such a great job with China. I was never quite on that boat because it, to me it just looked like this was just a reestablishing of the relationship of where it should be from the time it had fallen off under President Lee. So there was a lot of consternation in the U.S. Embassy and in D.C. Well, is she moving away from the U.S. and towards China? Uh, that, that, of course, hasn't proven to be the case, but the public remains very positive towards China on the surface. The problem is that once you dig down into the numbers and you start to break down well, what are the attitudes on China's military rise? On China's military rise, 75% across all age cohorts see it as a threat. That's not good, especially at a time when China's military is continuing to expand. So those, those could, go one, it could go one of both ways. Either they'll become more comfortable with China's increasing uh, military and then see it as less of a threat, so that might decline. On the other hand, if things kind of spark off around the Senkaku Islands, which now look like it's, it's calming down a bit, or in the South China Sea, if something happens there, those threat perceptions could rise. We're not sure where that will go, but right now, 75% across the board. The other problem is that the Chinese economy used to be seen as the panacea for Korea, that they were going to get into the market, they were going to sell there and take over, and it would just be such a huge economic opportunity that nothing could go wrong. Unfortunately, things have gone wrong where now attitudes on Chinese economy, it's, it's about 65 to 66% see it as a threat. There's a big difference in, in ages, where the older generations are more likely to see the Chinese economy as a threat and the younger generation is not. I think that has to do with just different perceptions of what Korea, Korea's economy is, where the older generation still think of Korea's economy as low value added and they're just putting things together. Of course, that's not the case. The young generation sees the Korean economy as high value added and that they can imp export items into China and sell them there. So that, that's where that comes from. But recently, with all the bad news coming out about uh, China's economy and how it relates to Korea, my, my perception is that the threat perception of China's economy is going to increase because we've seen all kinds of bad, bad news reports of what's happening to Samsung in China. The fact that Xiaomi is now the number one handset retailer there and all the Chinese companies are doing much better and Korea is losing out in China and not only in China but it's going to start to invade its markets around the world because Korea was never able to develop the software they were only hardware producers and they still are essentially and as China starts to overtake that what does that mean for Korea so China is going to be increasingly be seen as a threat on both of those well certainly on the economic side 
military, we're, we're not quite sure yet. Um, looking at the latest Asian barometer survey, it seems that Japan and Mongolia um, really have the most negative attitudes towards China. Mm -hmm. But Korea, I mean, at that time, in that, in that survey, the results were pretty good. I think over half of the Korean population believed that China had a positive role or positive effect on the region. So how do we explain that South Korean opinion seems to be more favorable, um, um, despite the fact that it is a major U.S. ally? I think, you know, that's one of the things that always comes up is the long history that Korea and China have shared. You know, going all the way back to the 1590s and the Imjin War, where Japan had invaded and China had sent troops to help defend the Korean Peninsula and ultimately the, the, the Chinese homeland. But I think that's also a part of it, that they do have this long relationship. And increasingly, China is not a threat to South Korea. They have good and increasingly good diplomatic relationships. Of course, South Korea would like to see some movement by China on North Korea. That's not yet happened. But overall, you know, I, I'm not so surprised that this relationship is, is seen as positive. But again, a lot of it will depend on what China does in the future. As there's an expectation that, well, it's, we're not just going after good relations for good relations sake. The South Korea is going to need to see movement on North Korea. And if it doesn't happen, I think those, those attitudes could begin to erode. Yeah, I think this would be my next question. There is a paradox here that South Korea is rather positive about China despite the fact that China supports North Korea. It's arch nemesis, so to speak. So right. um, to quote Bill Clinton, it's the economy stupid? Or, you know, how, how do you explain yeah, that? Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly right. You know, there's a lot of money to be made in China. And if Korean companies end up not being able to make that money, then what happens to attitudes towards China? Um, staying on the economy, um, as you already mentioned, um, the FTA with China was concluded. Mm -hmm. um, the South Korean public seems to have generally a positive attitude toward, towards that FTA. Right. Um, but if we remember the FTA with the United States, there were prolonged protests, political opposition. It was mm. a huge quagmire. So how do we explain you know, this, this difference? Because, again, the U.S. is supposed to be Korea's big ally. Right. Uh, the, the, the timing of the U.S. at the Corus FTA was a little bit different because it was on the heels. It was 2006, I believe. It was agreed 2008-ish. Mm. And South Korea had just gotten over a big bout of anti-Americanism in 2002. So there was already kind of ill will towards the U.S., and then this high-level FTA comes in where they're going to try to open up the agriculture markets. They're going to try, try to bring in more and more imports and try to, try to play, level the playing field in Korea. And so that's what brought out all the protests. But since that time has passed and the U.S., the core SU FTA has, has been ratified, attitudes on FTAs in general have mellowed, where even attitudes towards the, the core S FTA, which is once so controversial, is now generally positive. Attitudes on the FT, FTA with the EU, generally positive. And so attitudes on, on China yeah, are, are significantly more positive even now, but also because it's a low-level FTA. They didn't open the, up the agricultural market whatsoever, so you don't have the farmers out in the streets. And the farmers are actually the militant protesters. You know, those are the people who come out with steel bars and they really fight the police. And when you have that going on in the streets, I think that tends to color the rest of society as well because they see that on the news and think, wow, there's something really inherently wrong with this FTA. Otherwise, they wouldn't be out there fighting like this. But we haven't seen any of that in a very long time. And I think it, it might not be so reflective of the attitudes towards, towards China now. It's just the attitude towards FTAs in general. So could we say there, there has been a form of learning curve that now that the Koreans have heard of uh, the EU FTA, the FTA FTA, the negotiations with Australia and other countries, that they accept FTA as being you know, a very important tool of public policy and it's just business as usual. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. As long as the, the agriculture isn't threatened too much and they can kind of keep those a bit controlled, then there shouldn't be any problem in the rest of society. Just like everywhere else in the world, actually. Exactly. Right? So China and the U.S. share a similar level of public popularity in, in South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, what does this imply for the future positioning of Seoul between these two great powers, especially if there would be a a struggle at the regional level. We, we asked some of these questions about what the Korean public would, would prefer if there is, is this kind of, of, com of clashing or who needs to be the preferred security partner. And it's always a majority comes down on the favor of the, of that the trilateral alliance is most important. The trilateral alliance being the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. They, they want to see good relations with China, but they understand that if they are looking after their own security, that they will always come down on the side of the United States and Japan, despite the rough relations with Japan. In this interview, we talked a lot about how Koreans perceive their neighbors. Um, how about you know the other side? How do J Japan and China perceive Korea? Do you have any data on that as well? 
On China, there hasn't been that much. Doing a, a lot of the polling there is very difficult. Everything has to be approved through the Chinese government. And anything that's going to be even somewhat controversial, they will strike. We've tried to do polling in China. Questions we wanted to do were cut, and so it made doing the poll basically irrelevant. In, in Japan, what we hear a lot of, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is reflected within the actual polls that they do, uh, there's not as much polling that happens in Japan because it's much more expensive. It's about five times more expensive to do it in Japan than it is, is in Korea. But in general, we hear a lot, and anecdotally, that there is, is just Korea fatigue. Korea has always come back saying, well, Japan needs to do X, Y, and Z if they want to really repair relations. Japan thinks that it's trying to, to address those needs, and just when they think they're getting ready to address them, they feel that Korea then moves the goalpost. And now they have to do one more thing. And there's really a sense from, from what I'm told, not that I'm an expert on Japanese public opinion, but uh, all of the, the analysts who deal with that say that that is certainly what's happening. And a lot of people are, are almost wanting to give up on Korea and just say, you know what, Park Geun-hye doesn't want to meet Prime Minister Abe, Abe, fine. We don't need to meet Korea because we have the trilateral alliance. We are in line with what Washington wants. And Washington, when it wants it, will bring Korea in line. So while that's happening, we're going to try to improve relations with North Korea. We're going to try to improve relations with China and essentially isolate South Korea. And so far, if you're looking at you know, keeping score as of diplomacy, for me, I think Prime Minister Abe has outperformed President Park quite, quite fully. To conclude, uh, Carl Friedhoff, I'd like to uh, engage in some futurology. Okay. If you had to advise the leadership of Japan, China, or the United States, what policies would you recommend in order to improve um, the image Koreans have of their country. Um, what is Korean public opinion perceptive to? Uh, well, for, for South Koreans to, with regards to the U.S., just for the U.S., just keep doing what they're doing. Ratings all across the board are at historic highs. Uh, they've done an excellent job of managing the relationship. They're much more cautious of being seen as dictating policy to South Korea. So on the U.S. side, I don't think there's really anything to be done different. And in fact, try to try to keep that up. And now that everyone is aware of that, I think that will continue. So not really too many worries on the U.S. side, as long as there's no, nothing unforeseen. Because it's always the unforeseen thing that, that causes the, the huge problems. As for Japan, yeah, well, there, there's a lot that they have to do, quite frankly. Number one is that they really have to get a, a grip on, on, on how they're going to handle the comfort women issue. Because just allow, allowing it to continue on as it is is a solution, but it's not a particularly good one. They have to have some kind of proactive approach to deal with that. Dokdo is going to be there. I, I don't see any serious uh, push by Japan to really reclaim it. Yeah, there are the Shimane Prefecture, um, you know, uh, Takashima Day. Those things will always inflame public opinion. If they could kind of tamp those things down, then yeah, there might be room. But that's the thing about Korea-Japan relations is that it's almost on a timer that there are certain events that are going to happen. You know, Takashima Day is always going to happen. The, the review and the release of tech, history textbooks is always going to be there. It's always going Yasukuni. to be Yasukuni things. And so just when you have a window where you think there might be positive movement, an event comes up in Japan that the Japanese government understandably can't avoid because of domestic reasons. So it, I understand the Japanese government is in a difficult position, but they really do need to come out and try to solve something about the comfort women issue because if all of the women die before Japan has done anything about it, it then I think becomes an unsolvable issue. And what about China? If they're trying to improve views, uh, South Korean views of China, they're going to need to move on North Korea. We, we've seen some, well, every time we get a delegation coming through, inevitably they say, yeah, you know, we're really seeing China changing its tune on North Korea. There's really a change coming. And we've been hearing this for a couple of years now. So far, we haven't seen any actual real change, but if they, they can start to move on North Korea, perhaps putting a little more pressure on them, then I think we'll see South Koreans really turn to, to start to embrace China. But, you know, views of China are already fairly positive. So, Carl Friedhoff, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.